What's going on, MDRT Edge? Yeah? Nobody's had enough coffee. Come on, guys and gals. Let's dive in. Let's dive in. Anybody want to be a digital rock star? OK, good. You're in the right zone. Good news. By the way, I want us to start differently since I'm, you know, we're pitted against Tom Hegna. Can you guys just give me a yeah real quick? I want to hear it. Yeah! Love it. All right, we're going to channel that energy into this entire presentation. You're going to walk away just, you're going to, you're going to soar through the digital marketplace. I love branding, marketing, and figuring out ways for us to be the best versions of ourselves and to reach clients in ways that we have yet to even imagine. So that's what we're going to do. This is the journey I'm going to take you on. I, a couple things. You do need to have your phones ready. There are several slides I will point out to say, hey, take a picture of this. So just be prepared. There's a couple other interactive components to this. But we're going to talk about brand value optimization, which are three words most people don't even know what those three words mean together. But it's going to be awesome. How do we find a strategic way to meet our audience where they are, communicate effectively, and get them to become clients? How can we have a little fun, tell a few jokes, maybe become more relatable? How do we elevate ourselves as subject matter experts? Even though all of us already are, the key is to make sure that we're positioned that way online. And how do we cast the most effective digital net for ourselves and our practices? So here we go. You ready? Awesome. As Captain Obvious says, guess what? We live in a digital economy. Did you know that the largest population on Earth is not China? It's Facebook. And 93% of buying decisions today, and that's probably closer to 97 if you ask me, are influenced in some way, shape, or form, either somewhat or significantly, by digital and social media. So the question is, not whether or not any of this is true, how can we take advantage of that and galvanize it for ourselves? In this economy, the virtual consumer is in the driver's seat. They have now, more than ever before, resources to essentially do money entirely without the benefit of a professional. So if you want to think of what the biggest threat to your practice is, it's the fact that people might never need you because they can do it themselves without us. Do you know who your competition is? Anybody like Jate from State Farm? Had a lot more State Farm. Okay, good. All right. Anybody heard of Robo Advisors? Your favorite, right? Because they're so personal. What about FinCon? Nobody? It's a, probably one of the fastest growing communities of financial content creators. That's right, your friend, your neighbor who has a blog, runs a podcast, has a YouTube channel, works during the daytime at Starbucks or for the government, but just likes telling and sharing stories about money. But yes, that's the amateur professional. The amateur professional, meaning People like, listen, and consume that kind of stuff now more than ever before. Why? Because those people don't have an agenda. They're just sharing out of the goodness of their heart or some great experience. And we relate to that a lot more than we do when we know somebody has a practice or sells goods or services or what have you. So the question is, do you know which one of those or all of them your clients are engaging with? And most importantly, how do we stand out? Because in the digital marketplace, it's a pretty busy place, isn't it? The answer is your brand. What's a brand, though? I didn't really understand this. I was very fortunate that one of my earliest clients ran a branding company. And so I started to listen to him and understand what he did, and he shared a ton of stuff with me that was over my head for many years, and then I finally started to click. And it really solidified when he said, a brand is really about complete synergy with everything you do, 
you say, you deliver, and the way that you look, act, and speak. And I was like, wow, synergy, okay. And we can think of brands out there, right? Anybody heard of Disney? No? Okay, I'm in the wrong place. We're in Orlando, right? No Disney. Apple. And we understand that those are major brands, but they're purveyors of not just goods and services, they're purveyors of experience. We know what to expect when we see the Disney logo, right? Disney, by the way, if you didn't know this, they created and invented the money tree. They just shake the money tree and stuff just falls out. The 10 grand that you spent on that vacation, which by the way, if you got a couple kids and they're only three and four, you're gonna do it again in another couple years. What is your brand? Yes, it is what you do, what we do, what we deliver, who we are in the professional financial services space. But more importantly, it's who we do it for. And when I say who, I mean your ideal target, number one type of client you want to work with, the best fit for your practice. And most importantly, in the hierarchy of needs, why you do what you do. And this is the area of opportunity I want to encourage all of you to really be thinking about. We've all heard this throughout MDRT, NAFA, all beyond, right? What's your why? And effectively communicating our why. But it's beyond just a value statement or a mission. It's how do we find more meaningful ways to let people know who we are? Because People never buy our stuff, our process, our logo, our business card, the best whole life policy we can throw at them. They always buy us. So, how granular should you get when it comes to approaching your brand? Yeah, there's a lot of elements. And by the way, you might want to take a picture of this. We made this a science because it's not just the big things that we do. It's not just our website. It's not just whether or not we have a logo. Every little way that we can communicate, we had to take a look at. By the way, voicemail. How many times, even though we were talking earlier and Erica mentioned there's kind of voicemail phobia, but do people still call you and leave you a message once in a while? Not just our parents, right, that don't text. Did you know that you can leave an impression by just having a little bit better voicemail? Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think about what kind of impression you already leave? Just a thought. Yes, socks, ties, socks, right? I know, I usually win in the sock game. Everything you do and say, and by the way, is there synergy? One of the biggest areas that we miss, and this isn't just specific to financial services, but it is especially a, an Achilles heel of this industry, is that we do not communicate the same way in all of these places. Because we haven't taken the time to think about what it is, what is our messaging, and how are we communicating. And what happens unintentionally is we look one way on LinkedIn, and then maybe we have a different kind of a look and feel with our website, a little bit different, not too much, not in a way that we really think is noticeable. And then when clients come in, it's a little bit different. The materials that we use, maybe we run an independent practice. So we're pulling Jackson off the shelf and Prudential and this and that, and we're just using their stuff, right? And presenting that to the client. And all of a sudden, all of these elements of difference, if not paid attention to, create what's called cognitive dissonance. Right? It's a subconscious question in the minds of our clients to say, hmm, you know, something isn't synergized with this experience. Now, most of the time, maybe you're really, really good anyway, and people don't notice it. But the reality is we want to avoid and eliminate cognitive dissonance. We want to sound the same, look the same, act the same, and create an experience that's uniform. So another picture opportunity. How do you go about creating a brand strategy? First thing, you need to define the purpose of your brand. Not just what you deliver as a financial practitioner. Why you exist, and do your clients know it? And can they buy into it as they buy into you? What's your promise? Is it the best financial plan? Is it that you're gonna take care of them and their kids? That's all good, I hope you do that. But it should be more than that. 
what kind of a personality do you have? I use this example. Most of you, if you go to our website, will see that we have a bulldog as a logo. And that was a big area of conversation for us as practitioners. Why go in on a mascot? Why have a logo? All that kind of stuff. But we did it not just because the bulldog is the number one mascot in America, which it is, and I don't need any Georgia Bulldog fans to stand up and cheer. That's not for you. But we also felt like Bulldogs had elements of their personality that were fun, that we wanted to say, hey, this is a lot like us as practitioners. And we found an effective way to weave all that together. Positioning. Why you? We're in a room full of professionals. We all do similar things. Now, yes, we're all unique in our own way. But our clients and our prospects need to be able to see us differently. And as I already mentioned, the competition isn't in this room, right? The competition is, why do I even need you at all? So how do you stand out in that question and in that space? What is that unique value proposition? Do you have a really good tagline? All right. Everybody, send me an email. Because yes, every little impression matters. Raise your hand if you have an out-of-office message right now. OK, at least 60% of the room. Raise your hand if it's anything more than, hey, I'm not in the office. I'll be back tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever it is. Go ahead and send me an email, and you can see what I do with my out-of-office. Because I realize, like a voicemail, I have an opportunity to communicate, to generate an impression, to give somebody an emotional experience, even just reading an out-of-office. Because I travel a lot like many of us do. Why not have that be something more than just the bland, I'm not here? Questions you want to ask yourself. How visible are you? If you don't know the answer to that question, it's going to be very hard for you to have a good, effective digital brand. How do people find you currently in search engines? You want to know that. How do you prospect search? What are they looking for when they go online? Do you think that because they're working with you, they don't have financial questions, or they may not be reading other financial content? You want to know. When somebody gets to your website, what do they do? And whether or not you know what they do, what do you want them to do? Do you have the data to figure all of that out? No, a web website is not just a static thing that develops kind of digital relevance. Website should be interactive. Now, some of us, I know there are compliance considerations. We may not have as much control. But for those of us that can have thoughts about this, and, and maybe it's not the website component that we end up changing. But what do we want people to do when they interact with us online? Some of you have probably heard Dennis Mosley Williams speak in the past. We are in the experience economy. That's what the digital economy is all about. It's just experiences that happen in the virtual world that may stay there. Hopefully, eventually, they bleed into the real world. But it's about customization. So the, the era of spray and pray, put it out there in front of many eyeballs, and hopefully that funnel, that 1031 works, doesn't work anymore. The good news is you can be super specific, and you don't have to spray and pray anymore. Some of you may remember this, but Facebook and YouTube had a few advertisements over the last few years. And one of the ones that was the most memorable to me anyway was Facebook Basset Hounds commercial. Anybody remember that? OK. Essentially, you see a guy out there with his Basset Hound, and he's walking around in a place that looks like New York. There's a bunch of other dogs out there, and he's just kind of looking around, and it's uncomfortable, and they don't really say much. And then in the next scene, you see in slow-mo his basset hound bounding across the sand. And then they cut over to this hundreds of other basset hounds that are all, oh, I'm so glad he showed up. And the whole point of that advertisement for Facebook was to let you know that there's a group just for you. Right? So remember how I said earlier, what's your ideal client? That's the target that you want to spend all your time finding out and reaching and avoid the rest of it. And you don't have to do all of that. How personal can you make your communications? And how easy is it for people to interact with you and consume what you're putting out there? That's what inbound marketing is. Our practice 
is very fortunate. We get anywhere from as little as two to as many as a dozen digital leads every month. Some of you might say, well, that's not a whole lot. That's intentional. We used to get more and we realized we didn't have the capacity to handle more and we also had some quality control issues several years ago. So we had to do a better job of equipping people to tell our stories and we had to do a better job of communicating who we really want to work with so that way those that could self-eliminate because they realized they maybe aren't the fit for us. But do you have people coming to you or do you have to ask for referrals? What's the best way to get referrals, folks? You can yell, I can almost hear you. Be referable. Because if you're referable and you create an exceptional, extraordinary experience, you'll never have to ask. So do you have a digital buyer persona? All of us have a demographic profile for our ideal client. We know how much money they make. We know what niche, niche they work in and where they live and all this kind of stuff. And that's important. But what do they look like online? Very few of us have ever even thought of that. Right? How can you meet your clients where they are if you don't know where they are? So point number one, you need to spend some time creating a really well-defined digital profile for your ideal client. Are they on Facebook? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they in other places? If I knew most of my ideal clients weren't on Facebook, would it make sense for me to spend time marketing on Facebook? Does it do me any value? If the whole goal is to meet the people I want to meet, I should just meet them where they are. This will have a big impact on what you're trying to do. Ever ask your clients if they listen to a podcast, read a blog, or consume media? Who do they like? Who do they follow? Who are they interested in that's not you? And what questions do they still have? I know we're all amazing, and I'm sure that our practices are so good that our clients never have any financial questions after they work with us, right? Never. Just, we're good, we're done, it's good. We want to know. It's okay. We don't need to be afraid of them having interactions online. There's a way to leverage that for our benefit. And start telling better stories. What should we be interacting with? Maybe it's not money. That's the way that we start these conversations. Can we be more fun? You know what? The financial industry is notorious for being a level above CPAs and how fun we are, right? Anybody have clients who are like, you know what? I want my CPA and my financial professional to join me because we're going to go have a party. I hate saying it, folks, but that's just not how people see our industry. But that's OK. It doesn't mean we can't have fun with them. But how do you do that? Most people will come up and say, I don't know if I'm funny or I'm not a comedian. Well, that's okay, I'm not either. But we can still find ways to be fun. So, what topics might connect well? Let's go through a few of these and see if they land for you. When in doubt, never be afraid to poke fun at yourself. A lot of data and research support that leaders and professionals who are willing to be self-deprecating in a manner that doesn't tear you down too much, but is fun and makes you more relatable, the way that people see you goes way up in trust and admiration, just because you're willing to be vulnerable and funny at the same time. Any of us have life goals? A bucket list, is that one of them? If not, maybe it should be, right? What kind of food do you like to eat? How do you like to eat it? Where do you like to go? Why not have that kind of a conversation? Why not find out from your clients where they like to go, right? Anybody like the cookies outside? I didn't see many of you in the gym this morning. Maybe this is why. I don't know. Technology. We all got some fun stuff, right? Do we really want to know? What's happening with these listening devices, though? I don't know. Of course, my favorite, because I'm from Washington, DC, who doesn't love politics? I absolutely guarantee you there were more people buying lottery tickets than there were voting. Maybe that's why. Wrong party. 
And yes, as Abraham Lincoln reminds us all, perspective does matter. But why humor? Seriously, folks, why humor? Because psychologically speaking, it's one of the best ways to build relationship. We all love having fun. When we have fun, when we laugh, yes, laughter truly is the best medicine, we reduce stress and anxiety. Do you want your clients to be more stressed out or less stressed out? Do you want them to have a better mood when they're around you? Do you want them to even look forward to interacting with you? Do you want them to think more strategically when they work with you? And do you want them to be more satisfied? Do you want to stand out in all the right ways? And do you want to have a better experience? Hopefully, some of this is landing. But again, find the humorist in you. That's a huge way to start connecting. You don't just have to meet people and immediately try to draw them into a conversation about finances, insurance, or money. In fact, most people probably don't want to start there. But if you're really good at this, what happens? You go from just having centers of influence and a referral system to having brand ambassadors. And by the way, if you have people telling your story the right way because you've done this really well, that's referrals on digital steroids. Your capacity to generate opportunities for yourself goes up exponentially because people like telling people about people that they like and experiences are always shared. Go to a great restaurant, eat a good meal and don't tell anybody. I bet you even the thought of that doesn't make any sense, right? If we have a great experience, we tell people. So, what are people looking for online? I would speculate they're looking for someone that knows what they're talking about, right? Do we know what we're talking about? Have we passed tests, licenses, we're regulated? Hopefully we know what we're talking about. But do you think that that's enough? Experts online look different. How can you find ways to provide value that doesn't implicitly or explicitly say, you have to work with me to be able to receive all of that value? So maybe you want to write a book. I have. It's not even that long. I didn't write the war and peace on retirement income, but I, it was birthed out of my client saying, oh, wow, Brian, I really like this process of how you explain this. You've made it easier. Nobody's ever done that for me. And I was like, huh, I heard that a bunch of times. Maybe I should just quantify that and turn it into something. You might say, well, Brian, I'm not a writer. That's okay. Maybe it's a, it's a podcast. Maybe it's a video series. Maybe it's a white paper. But these are resources that shouldn't end with, for more, contact me. That's always implicit. These should be resources that are just designed to help somebody, whether or not they ever work with you. That's genuine, and that makes you stand out better. They don't want to see people that have agendas. What does effective content do? It's always something for free. But the key is the bullet point in the middle. Really good content helps us take that next step. It should never tell everybody all the steps they need to take. Why? Because frankly, they need to take those steps with us. But it should help them move that needle at least once, one degree. Get one step closer to making all the decisions that they're trying to make that they still just don't know how to make. And it's in, delivered in a manner that tells and shows and expresses to your audience you care enough to really figure out how to land so that way you, they feel like you're actually listening and paying attention to them and communicating in a manner that matters to them. All right, another picture opportunity. You notice that the word compliance is up there and I recognize compliance is always gonna be a part of our lives. There's a lot of ways to do this, so don't think you have to do it all. Maybe articles is a good opportunity. 
It's less than a book. It's usually between, you know, 500 to 1,000 words, usually 500 to 800. It's a great way to demonstrate subject matter expertise. And in the digital marketplace, there are now 10 times as many places you can publish information. NAFA being one of them, right? They got a blog. They're always looking for, for people to provide information. And you might think, well, NAFA, I'm sorry, MDRT, maybe those aren't places where it's going to matter to my clients. But if I'm publishing things and I'm writing articles, maybe that does have relevance, that at least I can say, hey, well, you know, I'm an author. I've written these articles. White papers are fantastic. Maybe you have content that's written that's white paper that you can kind of brand. And again, if it makes sense for your brand or you can co-brand it and use it in a meaningful way so you don't have to make it up yourself, great. If you're thinking about, hey, I'd love to do my own stuff, one great way to do a white paper is to do a case study on one of your best clients and what you did for them. And if you ask them, would they be willing to share that story so you could capture it and turn it into a piece that would tell other people why it's so great and why what you did for them was so meaningful? It's also a great way to build value and improve the experience. Interviews. There are over 587 new podcasts launched every single day. So it's a busy place. And yes, I've had a show for three years, and I'm not going to suggest all of us go out and launch a podcast, but with that many new shows, I can tell you, as somebody who runs a show, I'm always looking for people to interview. So maybe that's the great opportunity for you, is to find out what shows your clients are listening to and see if you can get on them. And videos, I'm going to get to that a little bit more. Videos is huge. So how do I do this? I love all this stuff, Brian, but I don't know what I can do. What can I really do? Well, don't do it yourself. Get help. Partner. Talk to your compliance officer. I already mentioned it. Be on somebody else's show. I'm very intentional about this because there are so many. And so I go out and I try to find a way to be interviewed. And even if it's not a show that's necessarily directly related to my ideal target audience, I implicitly get value out of that because I can now say, as seen on, right? I can have somebody else, when I'm a guest on their show and they post about it, tag me and put my stuff in there and say, we had a great interview with Brian. That gives me more credibility. And maybe if we do this right with the right audiences, it's not your show. You automatically get exposed to an audience that you didn't have to build and develop yourself. What a great opportunity. Make sure your content is SEO friendly. Everybody know what SEO stands for, right? Something everyone owns. No, sorry. Search engine optimization. Quality absolutely matters over quantity. One of the things that I do, and any of you that are connected with me on LinkedIn, you'll see this. I don't post a lot. You might be surprised. Here's a digital branding guy telling you. He doesn't post a lot because quality matters. I see people that post a lot. It gets busy. People wonder, why are you posting so much? Maybe you have a lot to post about, that's fine. But I don't want anybody to walk away thinking the key to me being better in the digital space is to just put more stuff out there. Quality matters more. Everybody's looking for FAQs. Maybe that's something you can do. Do you get backlinks? If you produce content in other places, make sure people have your website, link to you, tag you, all of that stuff matters. Makes you easier to find. And do you know the searcher intent for the content you're trying to put out there? One of the best, and here's a tip, write this down, one of the best ways to figure out how to actually title and write good things is to start to type a question you think your clients are asking into the Google bar and see what the autocomplete does. So that'll give you a whole bunch of things that say, this is Google telling you this is what people are already searching for. Maybe if you're creating something, the answer is, how do I answer this question, right? Simple tips and tricks. Anybody on LinkedIn? Four people, awesome. Well, this is gonna be great for you four. Please. 
please, please think about how you interact on LinkedIn. First thing, anybody that goes and connects with me or is already connected with me, the profile picture that 90% of us have out there is just a better version of our driver's license. It's not bad, but you can tell a better story. Go take a look at my profile picture and see if it looks different. But don't send auto-generated messages. Why? Because how many of us like receiving them? Nope, I didn't think I'd get any hands raised for that one. How many of us have received them? It's always that, hey, oh, I see we share a few things in, in common and I just want to be a part of your network and support you. Which means in about 20 seconds, you're going to get an auto-generated message from me that isn't going to be of value to you at all, right? We've all gotten that. So don't ever be that person. But more strategically, think about who you actually want to be connected to because I'm gonna debunk the myth that the more connections matter. No, more of the right connections matter. Having 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 LinkedIn contacts shouldn't be the goal, especially if 60% of them are people you may never really wanna do business with anyway. It doesn't necessarily enhance your brand value. So be thoughtful. I say no way more times than I say yes to connect and connection requests. And when I'm going on, I'm very thoughtful about who I want to be in relationship with and who I ask. And every time I reach out, if there's an opportunity for me to send a personal, thoughtful message, I do. Because that is something that people actually will respond to and respect me for and recognizing that I, yeah, I took the time. Because we can always tell when we take the time and when we can't. So be authentic, be interested. When you're making a connection, are you just doing it so that way you got a check? Why don't you communicate with those people? Why don't you invite them into you know, interaction? Why don't you let them know if you've got something coming up? How do you have actual relationships that happen apart from the content that you're producing? Which leads us to how do we all cast a better digital net? So I've already mentioned a couple places Here's a few more. Maybe microsites might be an opportunity. I have a problem. I, I own about 78 domain names and I keep buying more. It's a bit of a problem. My, my, my team understands this. They, they try to prevent me from doing it. It's just a lot of fun. Why do I tell you that? No, I have no intention of running 78 different websites, but what I do constantly think about is can I get a domain name that I could build as a content platform to just provide single value information either on one topic or to one audience? Those are great ways to better position yourself that have nothing to do with you or your website because your website shouldn't really try to be the catch-all for stuff, right? Here, I'll give you an example. Anybody live in a city I should, I should have more interaction. Some of you don't live in a city and that's okay too. So I bought the domain name WashingtonDCAdvisors.com. First of all, the fact that that was available blew me away. But then I started buying other CityAdvisors.com because I went out to see how many were actually there. Now you might be saying, well, who gives a crap, Brian? Why does that matter? That is the number one best way to show up in the Google search results outside of paid ads is to have it be geographically specific. And the domain name does it for you. So again, now that's not, you know, just a specific example of a microsite, but these are things that we want to be able to think about so we can be super strategic. That may not just be content in general. Please show your audience and your clients that you're listening to them, interact like other people's posts, be sure that you're commenting, and invite people to comment on you. I try to ask people as much as I can in all of my posts, tell me what you think about this, I wanna hear from you. I'm not asking them to come and contact me, I just want them to talk to me online. It's extremely powerful and effective. And monitor that. Do you know how many likes you get? How many eyeballs do you pay attention to your data and your statistics? If you 
put out a post and, and you have 1,000 connections and only 60 people are viewing the stuff that you're putting out, that should tell you one thing. People aren't really interested in what you're putting out. I have a, a, a very strategic minimum that I want to have in terms of views. And if I put something out that doesn't meet that minimum, I have to look at what did I do wrong. So I know and I'm constantly trying to find better ways to have content that people actually want to interact with and view and like and respond to. Here's another picture opportunity. How can you go about developing this type of a content strategy? Well, the first thing, and I mentioned it earlier, Google yourself and do it again. And maybe even ask some of your clients to search for you in their own way and, tell, and ask them to tell you was it easy? Was it hard? What did they find? Because you need to, before you start to make changes, you already need to see how you're showing up. Now, I have a problem, and it's not the domain thing. It's actually that there's another Ryan Haney out there who shows up more than I do because he's a Christian music artist and he's got all these music videos. So people got to filter through that stuff to get to me. But it's okay. I figured it out. No, we're not buddies online. But I know that, right? I've used it a couple times to my advantage. No, not the Christian music artist, right? I've found ways to take advantage of what I know is already happening because I've taken the time to know what's already happening. Audit your audience. If you have a digital buyer persona, do not be afraid to ask your clients, do they read blogs? Do they listen to podcasts? Do, where, do they con where do they consume financial news? Don't think it's just your newsletter that you send them. I guarantee you. Maybe it's Facebook, this, that. You want to know. You should want to know. And then use that as an opportunity to talk to them. Hey, that's great. Sim, why do you listen to that podcast? What do you like about it? Create a bridge. If people are already going to be going to those content places any, anyway, and maybe you're not going to be the one putting out a blog, use it as an opportunity, though, to have a better relationship with them. Because what that does is it heads off the issue that people will ultimately say, well, I don't really know if I want to work with you anymore because I've been listening to this podcast person and they keep saying X, Y, and Z. And I, I don't know, it seems convincing. They don't seem to have an agenda. Why are you doing this to me? They say it's not a good thing. You should know that that's happening and be willing to head that off, have a conversation. Oh, why did you think that was interesting? Oh, why do you think that they're saying that? Let's talk about it. If you don't have a year-long plan, if you're not really in this, don't think that you can make all these changes and start doing something and expect overnight success. If you're really trying to develop yourself as a digital branding expert and stand out as a subject matter expert, you need to play the long game. Hopefully you will have some short-term success, but it's, it's, it's a lot more about creating this persona that, that has people coming to you, and that just doesn't happen overnight. So please be in it to win it and make sure that this is holistically applied. Because I see a lot of times we just look at social media or online advertising in the little silo. Oh, I know I gotta do this, or oh, I know I gotta do that, or oh, I remember to post on LinkedIn. And it's disconnected from everything else that we're doing. But it shouldn't be, because that hurts instead of helps. And think outside the box. Just imagine the world that you could create. Maybe not this one, but something else. Questions, comments, concerns, needs, desires, longings, or considerations. Thank you so much. Um, How are you, Sam? Can't hear. I can hear you. You can hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Everybody else can hear? Yeah. Great. Okay. First of all, thank you so much. That was very, very useful. And my question that I have is that you said you had bought so many... Um, uh, domains mm -hmm. and uh, there's one domain which is your main website where all your traffic mm -hmm. and there where you do all your SEO and everything and you said you use the other domains for a particular topic mm -hmm. or how do you use those domains like there's so many of them and how do you optimize them and how does or do you just use it as a link to the client what exactly do you do with those wonderful question it, it depends on what the domain is and I'll give you an example you guys can look this up our niche market is associations, membership organizations like MDRT, NAFA, CPCU, FPI, whatever. So because we work with associations, I've found and bought the, the domain associationrisk.com. 
We set that site up to be an informational resource for association executives to go online and understand the risks that they face and give them enough information about how they might go about addressing it. Yes, it's loosely connected to us, but it's really just built out to provide information. And it's easy for us to position it that way and to send people to that and to ask other partners, hey, here's a great, you know, we don't even really tell people we're the ones that put it together, even though, yes, I mean, eventually you can figure out that if you want to need help, you can contact us. But we built it out just to help association executives answer that question. What are the risks that I face and what do I need to do about addressing them? And that's a good, there can be a lot of other things. It could be built around a market, you know? You could, you could say, hey, business owners. So, I don't know, how to protect my business and that's a little long, but something that could be built market specific, topic specific, just really depends. But that's, again, something to be able to think about as a resource. Two questions. One, um, what is your litmus test for when a social media posting for you deserves a boost at your expense? Uh, what's, what are you looking for in terms of boostability? And then the second one is how do you gracefully tell somebody to go away in the LinkedIn space without coming across as, well, something less than thoughtful? Wow, great questions. Um, the litmus test that we have, we don't do a lot of paid boosts uh, anymore. One of the reasons is because we get a lot of organic eyeballs already. But when we were doing it, and as we were trying to refine that science, uh, in LinkedIn it was at least 600. So if we weren't getting at least 600 views, it was a failure. Um, again, that's not a hard and fast number, that's just what we realized made sense for us given the number of connections and our target audience and all of that kind of stuff. So I, I, it's hard for me to sometimes answer it. I don't want you to walk away and say, okay, if I'm not getting 600 eyeballs, I'm failing. But more importantly, sometimes it was about timing of a boost. For example, when we go and uh, have a booth at a major association conference, we would do certain posts and then boost them as kind of a way to get people to essentially know that we're gonna be showing up at this conference and to come connect with us. So it wasn't even so much about the post itself, but it was all kind of a campaign to say, hey, we're gonna be here in person, and so are 6,000 of you, and we hope to see you. So it's just kind of really, again, it all depended on strategically what we were trying to do. Um, how do I gracefully say no? Well, for the connection requests that are just thoughtless, I, I don't tend to respond to all of those. I just hit decline because I can already tell it's not really going to matter. This person's just connecting and reaching out to me and putting me into a system that's automatically going to send me something that doesn't make any sense. When I can tell those, those that I'm not sure about and I'm trying to figure out if it is a fit, I respond back and I say, hey, really appreciate you reaching out. Always love expanding my digital network. What about my profile stood out to you? And I asked some very specific questions. And that's what I do as a head off, because if somebody doesn't read that and I just get auto-generated replies back, it's a wrap. But if they do respond and it's more, you know, it's a genuine interest, a mutual interest, then I can say okay and move forward. Other questions? You got a minute. Get them in while they're hot. Thank you, good stuff. Um, this other individual that has your name, I've had that problem. I wonder if you could shed some light on what you've done. Well, like I said, the first thing is I figured that out. It's always better to know than not know. Uh, it, it, it truthfully doesn't come up too often because of what we've done to position ourselves. If people are actually looking for us, they don't just search my name, it's more our company or Brian Heaney Financial Advisor or stuff like that. So I figured that out and it rarely if ever comes up but when it was still kind of happening, it just infrequently used it as a way, yeah, come check me out or come reach out to me and oh no, I'm not the Christian music artist. Right? So I just used it as an opportunity to poke fun at the situation or to let people know, hey, if you find this guy, that's not who you're looking for. So if that's coming up for you, figure out really how is your audience interacting in a manner that isn't helpful and then just you know, try to address it that way. 
That's it, everybody. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.